All right, let's turn in our Stewarding Life um, uh, lesson books. We're on lesson number seven, Stewarding Our Trials. A lot of interesting uh, and just good material coming this way, Stewarding Our Trials. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we'll read 10 verses there this morning. I need some readers. How about that? I need some people to read for us this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we'll read verses 1 through 10. And uh, let's see, who'll read verses 1 and 2? Who'll read verses 1 and 2? Brother Patrick's got 1 and 2. Who'll read 3 and 4? Anybody read 3 and 4? Brother Amory's got 3 and 4. 5 and 6, who'll read 5 and 6? Bruce has got 5 and 6, 7 and 8. Galen's got 7 and 8 and 9 and 10. Lucy says she'll got 9 and 10. All right, everybody got their... Assignment? All right, go ahead, Brother Patrick, start us off. Now, when, when you were, and maybe you still do this now, I know I kind of do, but around Christmas time, if you get gifts and they're under the tree as a kid, did you try to always, I know Michael did, you tried to figure out exactly, <laughs> he, he just looks like that kid that went and, and took the <laughs> box and was shaking and tried, did you ever do that, Michael? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> amen. Much prayer for me, Sako. Amen. Man, praise the Lord. <laughs> uh, we, sometimes we try to figure out the gifts that God gives to us, and man, we try to figure out, man, this circumstance came, praise the Lord for it, and try to figure out, especially when it's good things like that are profitable, like relationships, or when God blesses with finances. Uh, these things are great. But then, sometimes we get gifts that are not so great. For example, uh, unemployment, you lose your job, or, that's, or chronic disease, or the loss of a loved one, or, or these trials come our way, and we don't like those gifts so much. We kind of want right, to return to cinder on the box and <laughs> you know, send that thing back. Don't, don't really want it. But as we read in, in our passage today, um, Paul says several times, I glory in my infirmities. I glory in the trials uh, that are coming my way. And what a, what a different perspective. If we're talking about stewarding life, when the circumstances that are really out of our control come, how we respond to those, I mean, Paul sets it as if to say we should glory in it. When the rough things come, not to try to, oh, I just got to get this thing back. and No, but take it and be thankful for it in some uh, way. I mean, it's not easy. We're not talking about carnal people this morning. We're going to have to, talk, we're going to, have to move into the spiritual uh, because it's not in us to, to live like that. Um, one famous Christian, and he was made famous by his trials, uh, is a good picture of this, a man by the name of Job. 
He's, he's famous because of the trials that he went through. Um, we first meet Job, he's the wealthiest man in the East. He has everything a heart could wish for, great wealth, close-knit family. He's a leader in the community. He has the respect of all who know his name. Uh, yet in one day, he loses it all. I mean, all gone. Family, friends, riches, house, everything's gone except his own life. But even that was somewhat destroyed with uh, sickness. And his wife didn't leave him, but she told him, why don't you just curse God and die? So she, he even lost her support. <laughs> she said, dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. And in that very moment, Job made a choice. He could have said, I, that's it. But Job made a choice, and he said this in Job chapter 2, verse 10. Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? He made a choice right then and there. He said, when God gives good things, glory in his name. And when God gives bad things, glory in his name. And we're going to look at a little bit about that today. Job didn't pretend uh, that the trial didn't hurt. Uh, no doubt when he cried unto God, I mean, we see the whole book, he's crying unto God, basically, why? And it's not that, it's not that tr circumstances, and we just put our head in the clouds and say, no, 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 everything's fine, everything's fine. No, there's, there's you know, things to deal with. Uh, but Paul would even teach us, hey, um, I'm going to glory. <laughs> For when I'm weak, then is he made strong. So let's look at our, on our outline today there. Um, number one, uh, when trials come, how you steward something over which you have no control in the first place. No one chooses the trial that comes. They invade our lives without invita invitation. Uh, but it's a choice that we can accept them and yield to them and uh, let God work in our lives and bring forth good from these trials. And he does that uh, in these three areas. Trials, number one, they'll help us with humility. Uh, they'll help us with humility. And it doesn't matter who you are, all of us have a tendency to be prideful. It's just, it's, we're born with it. <laughs> and I still see Phoebe, she still goes to the light socket and wants to put her hand in there. <laughs> and it's just in her to do, you know, I'm going to do what I want to do. It's just, I didn't teach her, you know, it's just there. Uh, so we naturally want to be greater and greater and for others to recognize our greatness. That's, uh, I think any human would say, yeah, that's, that's what people want. But Paul, uh, if there was a Christian in the first century who could have boasted, who could have, you know, pulled on his suspenders and said, look at me, he would have been one of those guys. In fact, he was called up to heaven. As we read in our portion there, look at uh, verse number Number 2, chapter 12, verse number 2. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, whether out of the body I cannot tell. God knoweth such an one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body I cannot tell. God knoweth how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words which it is not lawful for a man to utter. So Paul is talking about himself here and he says, I went to the third heaven. Now let's talk about that real fast. Third heaven. There's three heavens. Oh, you're a Mormon? No. <laughs> Look, the first heaven is the air, which we see right here. It's this atmosphere. Then there's a second heaven. That's where the sun, the moon, the stars, space. But beyond that, my dear brother, there's a third heaven. And that's the abode of God. That's where God lives. That's where when you die and you know Christ, you go to heaven to be with him. The Bible says, absent from the body, present with the Lord. And he's in heaven. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. Amen. Look forward to that day. But Paul got a chance and he went to heaven. And he came back and said, man, we're going to line up seminars now. I'm going to tell everybody about my uh, experience in heaven. I'm going to write a book on uh, how to see heaven and what to do when you get there. And... <laughs> No, he didn't do that at all, but a lot of people today would, let me tell you, and, and they do that, you know, people have these visions, they write books and try to make all kinds of money about it, but most of Christians allow this privilege, may have re returned, written a book about it, they would lined up television interviews, nationwide seminars, and Paul could have done that, but he said it's not even, that's not the point, uh, that's not, um, that was not his intention there, uh, it's unlawful for a man to utter, so 
uh, it's a grace, humility is brought on by trials. And when you go through trials, probably this trial, some think, people think that this was when he got stoned and was left for dead. That people think he, he got to go to heaven. Uh, but he, God raised him back up and he, he didn't go on boasting. And that trial did not produce anything but humility in the man's life. He, he, he didn't even talk about this except this one time. This was something that really happened to him that was not even spoken of except right here as he's trying to uh, kind of sort of clear his name and, and talk to the uh, believers there at, at Corinth. But humility is a grace developed through the process of seeing our frailty and then trusting in God. That's the truth, humility. Not thinking more about ourselves. Not, really, it's not thinking less about ourselves. It's just not thinking about ourselves. That's humility. And understanding, man, we are frail and we need to trust uh, in God. In our good times, we may attempt life and ministry in our own strength, but when trouble comes our way, when you're laid up sick somewhere, that's when we realize, I need God. I need God. A, the presence of the trial. The presence of the trial for humility. A lot of people, you know, theologians have speculated for years about what this um, thorn in the flesh was there. It says there in verse number 7, Lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelation, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. Now, what, does anybody know what some positions are on what, what was the thorn in the flesh? Lucy? That is, that's definitely one of the positions. A lot of theologians say that that thorn in the flesh was really something that, exactly, you, you, Paul's working so hard, but it was finding out it's not about you, Paul. And he, you know, he, he that thorn was in the flesh to buffet him. And buffet means to punch. <laughs> it's like when Jesus was being crucified, they buffeted him. My pastor talked about they played blind man's bluff. And they would take a prisoner, wrap, uh, put a blindfold on him, and then all this, and put him in a circle around, or put him in the middle of the circle, and soldiers would just come up and clock you. And then they'd take the blindfold off and say, all right, who hit you? And if you couldn't get it, then they'll say, we're going to play again. And they put, I mean, it was just brutal. And they did that to Christ. Uh, and they buffeted him that way. Uh, but uh, Paul says here, same word, the messenger of, to buffet me. Uh, there's another, though, Brother Tim, what was it? Did you have? Yeah, some people think also that uh, the thorn in his flesh was eyesight, that this great man of God really had trouble seeing, and it really uh, hindered him from doing the ministry that he wanted to. And as he wrote in Galatians there, he said, you see how large a letter I have written. And he also makes mention of that, uh, let's see, I think it's written right here. Yeah, Galatians chapter 4, verse 13 and 15, it says, You know how through the infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel to you at the first. Where is that blessedness then you spake of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. And so some people think that Paul uh, had a, an eye problem that he desperately wanted to get rid of so he could go on. I mean, he no doubt thought that this was hindering his service for the Lord. And he sought God three times uh, to get rid of it. Uh, to Paul, it felt confining. Whatever it is, whether it was this, uh, it was true that, man, the, the things he's working for are just not uh, coming together, or whether it was a physical eye problem that he had, whatever it was, uh, it was a constant pain, uh, a constant and painful burden. To Paul, it felt confining to the point that he believed he could minister better without it. In fact, three times he pled ur urgently with the Lord to please take it from him. Uh, verse number 8 there, it says, For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And 
Here's a question for us. Do we have a thorn in our side? That's an expression for you. He's a thorn in my side. You know, maybe, uh, maybe it's there for a good reason. Nah. Maybe it's a trial that's there, that's, it's there and it's going to help us. <laughs> and maybe it'll help us keep us humble. That's what Paul, because Paul could have been man. Have you been to heaven? I have. Luke, did you go to heaven? Oh, I went there. Hey, John Mark, Barnabas, y'all, any of y'all been to heaven? I've been to heaven. And I've had revelations and I've had visions. But to keep me in a mode of humility, God gave him a thorn in the flesh. And he said, uh, you know, why don't you please, could you get rid of it for me? But then we see a letter B there on your outline. The purpose of the trial. The purpose of the trial. purpose of the trial was, as we were just talking about, it's, uh, it was to keep him humble. It kept him humble. Because here's a man who wrote 13, at least 13 of the New Testament, of the 21, 20, how many books are in the New Testament? 27? Come on, anybody? Old Testament is, there's 66 total. Anybody got a phone? 27. Siri, how many books are in the Old Testament? <laughs> how many books are in the New Testament? But I think it's 27 and then 34? No, 30, 39. That's it. I got it. 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New. And Paul wrote uh, thir- at least 13. Who can name the books Paul wrote? I'll get you started. Uh, Romans. Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, Philemon, and that's the 13th for sure. A lot of people do think he, he was, what, that he wrote, huh? He didn't write, no, Luke wrote Acts. What's that? So does Paul? Under Paul. Under Paul. <laughs> and we don't know if he wrote Hebrews or not, but we do know that it's the man's job to make the coffee in the morning because Hebrews. Okay, <laughs> 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 yeah, that's right. That's why Michael brought the coffee. Amen, brother. Biblical this morning. <laughs> but, you know, P- Paul was... Um, God used him to pen 13, at least, maybe 14 books of the New Testament. Almost, if it's 14, that's over half of the inspired writings of the Word of God was used by this one man. I mean, wow. He also went to heaven. Um, But the truth is this thorn in the flesh and this idea of stewarding our trials, and he went through a lot of things. His uh, success quote-unquote, in in the ministry, was due to having that thorn in the flesh. It was, the the purpose was to keep him humble. Uh, Much of the effectiveness in Paul's life came not from the churches he planted or the suffering he endured, but from a mysterious difficulty which he carried throughout his ministry. It was this, uh, you know, verses 7 to the end there, lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelation there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me, and he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. His effectiveness in ministry was coming from this thorn in the flesh. It kept him humble. It kept him dependent upon the Lord. It kept him from being overly prideful 
and kept him from being puffed up. It kept him from being exalted above measure, which, I mean, you've been to heaven, <laughs> and you've seen the risen Savior, and you have penned, used by God to pen at least 13 of the New Testament books. But his effectiveness was not because of any genius or because of any personal power. It was because of this thorn in the flesh, an infirmity. Amazing. Then, then let, let her see there uh, the pathway of the trial. The pathway of the trial. Now this is interesting. The pathway was the devil. He's the one who did it. It wasn't God who did this to him. It was the devil. Look what it says there in verse number 7. Uh, it was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. The messenger of Satan. Trials are never easy, but, you know, if we know, well, God did this to me, then we understand it's a little easier to bear. But God didn't do this to Job, uh, to, to Paul. The devil did this to Paul. And also in the life of Job, God did not do that to Job. The devil is the one who caused all the problems. The devil is the one who caused his wealth to go. The devil is the one who destroyed his personal health. But through all that, we understand this. The devil is on God's leash. He cannot go past what God allows. And so that helps us understand trials sometimes when they come our way. It's not that God's mean to us or that God's... It's the devil, <laughs> amen. The devil was the one who gave the thorn in the flesh. It was the devil who destroyed Job. But it was God who made this promise, I work all things, all things work together for good. So the devil can never go past what God allows in your life. It might not be directly from God. The trial, and this is good to keep in mind, might not be directly from God, but it's allowed of God, which then makes us think God's in control. And the devil can't destroy me, though he wants to, that's nice. It's the, I don't think about it. Yeah, God's trying to destroy me here. No, God's not trying to destroy you. The Satan is the destroyer. He's the one who wants to destroy you. But it's God who will say that's enough at all times. And we see that in Paul's life. We see that in Job's life. The stories, these two stories of Job's sorrow, Paul's pain, reveal the comforting truth that even Satan can go no further than God allows. He just can't do it. Um, thus, everything that comes our way, though it may be not sent by God, it's filtered by our loving Father. And so absolutely nothing enters our lives accidentally. Additionally, God allows nothing into our experience that he does not have the power to redeem for our good and for his glory. Amen. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God. And my pastor used to talk about making a cake, and you take the individual ingredients of that cake, and it's not nice to eat a spoonful of salt. And it's not nice to take a big pile of flour and just shove it in your mouth. It's terrible. I mean, nobody wants that. Or eat a raw egg. Unless you're Japanese. I mean, I think some Japanese people like to eat raw <laughs> eggs. But for the rest of, of, <laughs> uh, of us, you know, raw, eating raw eggs is not good. But when you take all those ingredients together and put some sugar in there and, and flour and salt uh, and uh, the eggs and you mix it all and you apply the heat guess what you get? You get a beautiful cookie, you get a beautiful cake, it tastes great, and that's how it is with our lives. Sometimes the individual things that go on are like, this ain't good. <laughs> this doesn't taste good. But we have a promise from God that all things, all things, that includes loss, physical pain, emotional suffering, mental anguish, slander, loneliness, cancer, persecution, all things. It even includes the messenger of Satan. All of it works together for, God, for, for good, to them to love God. Amen. I mean, that's, we're talking about stewarding life, and part of your life is having trials and, and having tribulation and having those things. And this morning I'm going to preach on Abraham. And um, Somebody said that the constant communion with God is simply preparation for the trial that's coming. Because it's coming, and we'll see that this morning. But, you know, as we um, walk with God and, and live with the Lord there, all things work together for good. All right. Mm. Yeah, amen. 
Fanny Crosby, extremely famous hymn writer, wrote Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. I mean, and, I mean, you just go through the hymn book and you're like, wow, Fanny Crosby wrote that. Wow, Fanny Crosby wrote that. Well, when she was a baby, through a mistake of the doctor, he, uh, she lost her eyesight. She was born, could see, but through a mistake of the doctor, she, was, she lived her life as a blind, uh, blind woman. But even so, she wrote, I think, eight, over 8,000 hymns in her life. Um, she, she stewarded her trial rather well, I think. <laughs> you know, she, she just went on through, and all things worked together for good. All right, I wanted to show you this. Uh, let, let's see. Number two there, stability. Stability. Trials bring stability. In the midst of adversity, we feel so unstable. It seems we'll collapse under the weight of suffering. And yet, during these times, God infuses us with His strength. He provides a stability that is beyond human comprehension. Look at verses 9 and 10 there. He says, my, He said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, Paul says, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You know, letter A, they're strengthened by the grace of God. Strengthened by the grace of God. It's, it's, it's at the times that we are, um, you know, at our spiritual low or the times that we are going through the, like, the, I can't believe this. It's then that the grace of God, <laughs> it just overflows your life. I just think about my own situation that one time when I got deployed to Africa, Titus was three months old. I was getting out of the military. I had seven months left in active duty service. And I'm preparing to leave the Air Force. And then I got deployed to Djibouti, to the Horn of Africa. And I just thought, what is this? <laughs> you know, I, this, I'm done with the war. I'm done with playing war. I don't even have Kim gear. <laughs> and I didn't even get none. They sent me over there and they said, where's your sea bag? I said, I, didn't, I don't have one. <laughs> it was bad. You know, but I just thought, what is, what is going on here? This is not uh, part of the plan. But I'll tell you one thing, and that was on Christmas Eve to beat it all. I mean, I, was the, I showed up on Christmas Eve. And then the guy, my officer, Master, I can't remember his last name, but he goes, who are you? He said, we don't even have you on the passengers. We didn't know you were coming here. I said, this is Unbelievable. But I, I'm just telling you, some of those times, for that five, six months, uh, I had some of the sweetest times with the Lord. Seriously. It's, you, and, and you can't enter that unless you go <laughs> through it. I, I just, that's just, uh, it's kind of a paradox there, but, uh, I mean, I, I, you talk about depending on the Lord. Good night. And it gets worse. I'm an AFN broadcaster. I'm a trained journalist there to do my job. And then they said, we've got to augment some people to stand guard at the gate. And, I, and they said, Aaron McKittrick, we're pretty much going to put you out there. <laughs> and I said, Lord, I, can't, I, I don't know any. I'm done. I mean, you got to check. I mean, first of all, I'm in the Air Force. And then second of all, I'm an AFN guy. I'm not necessarily, uh, I'm not sliding the Air Force. I'm in it, well, 70 years. But I wasn't, I wasn't in the war mindset. I wasn't in the mindset of getting my M16 on and going out with my Kevlar uh, and standing in the gate to stop any you know, Arabs that might want to come in. And blow. I wasn't in that mindset. And I just thought, Lord, <laughs> what is going on here? But he worked it all out, but I learned to trust in him. And you know, he, uh, he had a master sergeant, a senior master sergeant come through. He was the shirt, our first shirt. And he found out that my leadership was going to put me on the gate. And he, he was about this tall, but looked like Bo, if y'all remember Bo. I mean, this guy was a bodybuilder, a little shorter than me, but the size of Bo. And just looked mean. I mean, <laughs> he just looked mean. And he went to the leadership and said, no, we're not doing that. He's got a job to do, and 
And, but I mean, I, I watched the Lord work that thing out, and I just thought, Phew. But those are the tough times, you know, those are the trials, and you've got to trust in God and say, God, I obviously don't like this or understand it, but I'm going to trust your word. All things work together for good, to then to love the Lord. And, and God did use that in my life and, and in others. So, uh, strengthened by the grace of God, be purified by the grace of God. Purified by the grace of God. We've got to hurry, I'm sorry. And then number three, letter three, number three there, ability, ability. So our, through our trials, God gives us humility, God gives us stability, but he also gives us supernatural ability through his power. Through his power. A, and we don't have time to get into this, but I wanted to show you a quick uh, three, and then B, through his precepts through his precepts. Now, trusting God, trusting God through trials is kind of like this. When you're right starting to walk with God, you might get a five-pound trial. But you've got to learn to deal with this one because, remember, God's in control of everything. He's not going to put a 35 kettlebell on you. He'll put the five pound on you. You get used to working with it. And when you work out, you can't start out here. You have to start low. And then once you get used to this one, then you can maybe move up to the 10 pound. And God knows all of us, and he knows how frail we are, and he knows as he's trying to make us into his son, to be conformed to the image of his son, he knows when to give us the 10 pound and how long we need to hold on to that 10 pound and deal with the 10 pound before we get up to the 20. Get a little stronger now. See, when you start lifting weights, you don't go in there and put on 300 bench press. You can't. And I remember starting out when I went to, uh, in ninth grade in high school, I, they did a max bench press, and I maxed out 95 pounds. <laughs> I mean, that was pitiful, you know. Uh, but the, that's the bar and 225s. That's all I could do. But by the end of high school, I pushed 300. I was right at 295 for a little guy. You know, not bad. But it t you can't do that to start out with. And you can't just start with this kind of stuff. And, that, and God knows that in our trials. He'll start us out right where we need to be. And then he gives the ability the next time, hey, you can handle a little more now. You can handle a little, a little more this time. Now he's not ready just yet. Hold off. He needs to work out a little more with that weight right there. All right, I believe he's ready for the next one. God, he knows, he never puts more on us than we can bear. He said that in his word. He just won't do it. But all things work together for good, and when the trials come, we're talking about stewarding our, our life, and when the trials come, man, we could, you know, steward them and be grateful for them and understand, I, I don't like it, but this is going to help me. God is in control. It might be that God's allowed this to happen, but it could be the devil trying to destroy me. But God's grace is sufficient. And he'll take care of me, and I'm going to actually I'm gonna embrace this trial. I'm going to glory in it. Thank you, God, for letting me be in a car crash the other day. <laughs> for real? Thank you, God, for the sickness that's coming to my life. Thank you, God, for the infirmities that I have to deal with. Thank you, God, for the persecution that I'm receiving at work. I appreciate that, Father. Thank you. Help me to, help me to embrace that and to uh, learn from it and go on and, uh, you know, and mature in the Christian faith. Amen. Stewarding our trials. I believe that. Is that all your blanks there? All right. Close with this. Most of us don't often pray for grace on our good days, do we? <laughs> but it's when we go through the tough times. That's when we get close to God and say, oh, God, I need you. And God knows that, and so it's good when the trials come our way. Yeah, most gladly, therefore, will I glory in my infirmities. Uh, and when I'm weak, he's strong. Amen. Let's close in prayer. Our Father, we thank you for uh, the trials that do come into our life from time to time. And Lord, help us to learn to be obedient servants and help us, God, to be trust in, trusting in you and in your grace that it is sufficient. And Lord, we, we will glory, therefore, uh, in the trials that come our way. Please bless the remainder of the day and bless the preaching hour and the uh, time of fellowship and the good singing this morning. We love you and thank you and praise you for being our Savior. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed. Thank you.